I'm Lauren Furman, President and CEO of the Colorado Chamber of Commerce, and I am super excited about this panel this morning and talking to some leaders of the energy industry today. So I'm going to give them a minute just to introduce themselves, and then we're going to jump right into the questions. Bob, can we start with you? Bob Boswell. I'm uh, CEO of Laramie Energy. Uh, we're a producer in the Piance Basin. We operate about 1,500 wells, predominantly naturally. Uh, gas production. We've been uh, in the basin uh, operating since around uh, 2003. Kim? Okay. So, good morning. I'm Kim McHugh. I am the vice president of the Rockies business unit for Chevron. I'm officially a week and a half into the role, so if you're wondering why I'm up here talking to you as a leader, we'll try to figure that out together. Um, but my background is I've been the, the vice president of the Wells organization for Chevron globally for about the fi last five or six years, which is all drilling, completions, work over operations, anywhere Chevron operates. So very, very excited to be here with this group. I've had a fantastic day and looking forward to more of the conversations. Thanks, Kate. Okay. Brian? Uh, good morning. My name is Brian Owens. I'm the president and general manager for Oxy in the Rockies, so that's Colorado and Wyoming. Sorry about that. Never get with the mic. Long time Coloradan, uh, family going back to the 1800s. Uh, locally, went to high school in Fruta, went on to go to Colorado School of Mines for a couple of petroleum degrees. Uh, and just want to mention that Oxy really sees a lot of robust investment opportunities in Colorado. Do a brief shout out on how well the state has engages on regulators versus other states. Uh, we believe the regs are manageable, and I'd like to mention that uh, the perception internally and externally is Colorado's a tough place to work. Having worked in California, that's a fact. Uh, and we do want to seek timely development. So that's kind of my opening comments. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Sexton. I'm uh, the chairman and CEO of Evergreen Natural Resources. <clears throat> We are a coal bed methane operator. Um, all of our production is uh, in Los Animas County near Trinidad, uh, 2200 CBM wells. Uh, we uh, are a reincarnation of the original Evergreen that developed the project back in, uh, started in the uh, mid to late 90s and emerged into Pioneer in 2004. Our team bought it back uh, about five years ago from Pioneer when Pioneer was divesting assets outside the Permian. Uh, I noticed uh, I didn't do a very good job of my bio. It's pretty sparse. Uh, what's not in my bio that you probably ought to know about me is that the whole reason I'm in the energy business and have been for a long, a long time, a lot longer than I ever thought, um, was that I was working summers in Yosemite when I was in college, totally fell in love with the mountains and wanted to go climb big mountains and friends said, go to Alaska. and. Uh, I had my eye on Denali, and uh, I will always be grateful to Amico Production Company for hiring me right out of college and sending me to Alaska, and then I will never forgive Amico for two years later transferring me, kicking and screaming to Denver at the beginning of Alaska summer while I was actually out <laughs> climbing Denali. <clears throat> but I came to Denver in 1980 for what I thought would be two years, and that was 42 years ago. So. Colorado is a great place to live, and I love it here. Thank you, Mark. All right, let's get into it. First question. I think it's an understatement to say that over the last eight to 10 years, the industry has changed, the climate here has changed, the environment has changed dramatically for the oil and gas industry. Tell us how that has impacted your operations, and, and how do you think that it has you know, created some challenges for even some of the regulators here in the room that are having to adopt some of the new laws, many, many new laws and regulations that have been adopted over those eight to 10 years. Bob, let's start with you. Okay. Well, it's been an interesting t uh, 20 years, and I think we've made great progress both as an industry and as a, as a nation and as a state. Uh, but there have been a lot of headwinds, and one of the things that uh, has been uh, challenging has been the cascade of new regulations, uh, and particularly so in Colorado. And the, we seem to legislate faster than we can administer. There are several examples of that. Uh, we have four bills in front of us that I think are before the end of this month, the Bacon Act, which could uh, limit uh, uh, development in Colorado significantly. We have a Water Act, uh, we have a Disproportionate Community Act, and then we had wildlife. And we're dealing with all these all the time while we're further implementing uh, House Bill 181, 
So those are the types of things. But the good news is, both as a state and as a country, we've been able to uh, really uh, decrease our uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, particularly CO2. I think since 2005, the United States has decreased their CO2 emissions by some 24 percent. The second best was uh, Japan at 21 percent, while we've seen China and India increase theirs by as much as 21 percent. And the U.S. and European uh, Union uh, altogether, uh, their total greenhouse gas CO2 emissions uh, are less, uh, are about a third of what China alone emits. So we're making good progress. There's more to do. Uh, our industry is composed of mainly engineers, scientists, uh, people who are technical by background. You give us a problem, we'll solve it. I think there's evidence of that. We need to continue to work together. We've worked very well with the uh, uh, communities we work in, uh, Garfield, uh, Mesa, and Rio Blanco, and we need to continue to do that for our common cause. Kim, tell us, Bob just mentioned <coughs> a, a lot of new bills that are still coming, and you're still trying, your, your operations are still trying to comply with the existing laws and regulations. Tell us why you, your company needs certainty. Why is that so important? Well, yeah, so the, the, the certainty helps, one, because we need to have continuity in our operations. I think that makes for safer operations, right? And so when you have uncertainty, many of you from my Wells background, shut it down, pick it up, it's really hard to continue to get that competent workforce to be able to come in. Also, from just a planning aspect, how do you plan your business if you don't have that certainty? And, and I'd also add that the certainty helps in just how we can progress the new technologies. Because you actually need a place to trial it, you need to know where you're headed, and I think that's, that's really important. It, and I want to add, because Bob mentioned this working together. So again, short time frame, I've been able to see this in Colorado. I think this is some best practices on how regulators and the local governments and the operators are, are coming together to try to work this together. And I've seen it firsthand, you know, and so I, I take you back to Macondo, which is a terrible incident for our industry. Doesn't matter onshore or offshore. And the way that the operators came together and we worked together to solve problems, then with the regulators to get back to where people would trust us, that we could get back. I see that same opportunity in this, this coming together to really share some best practices. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Brian, do you want to pile on there with the need for collaboration? <laughs> sure thing. So I'm going to build in a few other points with that, if you don't mind. Of course. We really want to operate at a higher activity level than we're doing right now in Colorado. And that goes back to not just developing, investing, but doing it prudently. So the two key words really are about the certainty and consistency. You're making it really hard an operator to do the very best they can if you don't allow us to have the, the breathing room to go implement evolving best practices. So if we could put a little more focus on that, we'll stay way ahead of whatever regulations would do. I do believe the regulations have really good intent, and we've been working through that. Uh, we do embrace the uh, opportunities to improve and we're working with others, the partnership. So I think generally we are supportive and collaborative, but that's not going to always be the case. There will be a time where we have to stand up a little bit, but give us a chance to implement the very best and not just change the rules all the time. Great For both point. the operators and state agencies, I think we really do have to have that partnership to create those protective standards. If you look at an oil field from five years ago, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, very different, and then even if you think about a given basin, basins like the DJ are really exceptional, and I'm really proud of what Oxy's done. What does it take to get a permit? Well, thankfully, okay, it's a lot clearer than it was a year ago. A year ago, I lost sleep. I don't <laughs> lose sleep as much as I used to. If we don't completely understand the rules, then it really makes it hard to implement. So going back to certainty and consistency, we would really like to get, so I'm gonna end with, we really wanna to get to the point, we can operate at a higher activity level. That means bringing in more rigs, more frack cores, and stay ahead of that urban encroachment. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Mark, I know some of the concerns are about the workload on regulars. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, it's a little easier for me to look at it perspective-wise. I remember the original Evergreen operating 15 to 25 years ago versus uh, coming back in. People ask me, what, what was the biggest difference I noticed coming back to Trinidad after being gone for 15 years? And <clears throat> the biggest difference I noticed uh, and 
locally anyway, was that there were um, suddenly three dozen cannabis shops in Trinidad that did not exist before um, <laughs> and had done a little bit to help change the culture of the area. Um, but the area was still very pro-development, pro-industry. Uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of emphasis trying to get the coal mines even going again, um, which um, apparently is not going to happen due to economics. But as the industry, the, <coughs> the community has been very, very supportive of the oil and gas industry and the, unit, the industry um, has worked very closely with local city and county governments. Uh, feels we have a very good, we, we have a very good relationship with the, uh, with the community. We want to have a great relationship with the regulators. Uh, the thing I've noticed the most, especially coming out of Senate, after Senate Bill 181, the rulemaking is that <coughs> we're still working out the details on <coughs> what makes sense operationally in each of these different basins. Uh, gone all over the state, I see the see the job that really great operators do in different areas, but um, you know, I wish I could say every company was a great operator. We are fortunate to have you know, four on this panel. Uh, maybe that's why we were selected. I think they, these companies are great operators. I recognize that not every operator is, uh, but most are, and most are trying to do the right thing. They're mem active members of their communities. <coughs> I'm actually concerned the most with the burden that is on the state regulators to figure this out and perform because it's clear that the West Slope is not like the DJ Basin and certainly Los Animas County is not like <coughs> the DJ Basin or the West Slope. The concerns are different, the uh, issues dealing with uh, urban encroachment or <coughs> dealing with you know, what the community needs, uh, what the community wants, what they need, uh, what they want out of their relationship with industry. We try to provide it, but I see the regulators have a tremendous burden figuring out the differences. And uh, I want to work with the regulators more actively uh, and openly and transparently. Um, but my concern is the regulators and trying to figure out how to implement the new rules are trying to do so uh, say, well, this is the rule and it works over here, so why wouldn't it work over here? And understand the differences. And what, what I do appreciate is that the uh, <coughs> Oil and Gas Commission and staff came down to the Raton Basin recently, just last month, and to see the differences for themselves. And I think, and I appreciate the fact that the commissioners and staff are willing to do that. But my biggest concern is working with and helping the regulators figure this out because I think the burden on them right now from what I see is, is tremendous. Thank you, Mark. Great point. All right, so we talked a little bit about some of the challenges of your operations, but tell us how you think some of the local governments and municipalities can help partner with you on some of your mutual interests. Kim, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you on this one. Yeah, so again, remembering I'm catching up, so there's a lot to, to, to learn here. But I had the benefit of last week going out and seeing our operations out in Well County, and I have to say, the work that we're doing out there on um, asset retirements, mm -hmm. our old facilities, so 90% of our emissions actually come from our old facilities as uh, supporting by vertical wells. So the help we can get there to be able to get those permits, again, going in the surface locations for our horizontal program allows us then to go and you know remove those assets, improve our emissions, so I think that's important. I, I mean, we were able to get the first comprehensive development plan in Colorado in the Mustang area. And by doing that, we were able to really make some changes. And I got to see those tankless facilities. We were able to put infrastructure in instead of having to have tra truck traffic. Um, we've been able to do some really amazing things. And in that, we were able to reduce our emissions by our legacy type of designs by 92%, our surface imprint of like 95%. So the more we can get these future permits in and working with us on those surface locations, we actually can make a huge improvement in the emissions and how we're showing up. And, and Chevron, we want to grow. We want to be out there. We want more activity because our goal is affordable, reliable, ever cleaner. I think I'll say from Scott Tink, lower carbon emissions on our operations. That's how we're going to get there. Thank you, Kim. Bob, you want to touch on that one? Well, I, you know, I think um, 
what, what we found, and I think under Julie Murphy's leadership with the COGCC and local governments, that we're having better uh, understanding. And I think that's really important that the COGCC uh, works with the local uh, communities to understand uh, their needs, their differences. Uh, and I think we're uh, uh, doing a better job of that. Great. Thank you, Brian. Brian, I know you've done some tours around the state, some things you want to touch on. <coughs> Um, yeah, we've done some. We've done countless tours. I'm looking at a group of folks I heard earlier this morning say, right out here in front, <laughs> they'd be happy to do a whole lot more tours. So we're happy to bring out government regulators or whoever needs to understand what a modern oil field looks like. It's all about, do you smell anything? No. Does it look kind of not so good? No. So audio, video, and a, a smell. So best practices. It's good to highlight where we're at versus we were just a few years ago. And I think that's a great way to end with your, your comment. So Colorado, this is a key number for everybody to remember. I hope you remember this one thing for me today. Oxy has the lowest CO2 equivalent intensity of any operator in Colorado. EPA scope one. It's two metric tons per thousand BOE. You can hear about other companies that will uh, uh, European company, I won't say them by name right now, they're at seven, right? We're at two. So it's amazing. And then you think about other things in addition to just those CO2 equivalent emissions, like because it builds in things like NOx. We have over 6,000 air monitoring samples around the edge of our operations from drilling, completions, production. We haven't been close to exceeding any health guidance at just a few hundred feet away. The rules that were set up for 2,000 feet away, worst case conditions, the wind's just right, all facilities emitting. How do you protect somebody at 2,000 feet? So that distance was established. So we feel really good at even just a few hundred feet away from our operations that were an order of magnitude better than any health guideline. So what else could we get some help on, right? So I'm gonna look around the room because this involves a lot of people here. So if you can remember this one, most people don't really understand oil and gas. And there's only so much oil and gas companies can do and we're not always viewed in the right lens. So I'd really like to see local government regulators better inform the general public, those home developers, those builders, and even realtors. People don't necessarily read the paperwork when they buy a home. <laughs> Somebody may even buy the home online. So how do you make it easier for them? And I thought of like two great resources to use an example. COGCC set up a fantastic, on their website, some GIS maps. Take a look, where are those oil fields at? The resources are there. Where are the wells that are about to be drilled? Where are the wells that have been abandoned? So the resources are there, but they're not getting out there to folks that need to know. Oxy, so I'll do a little plug for Oxy. We have a fantastic stakeholder website. Gives you all sorts of information on the development we have going on, tons of basic oil and gas resources. So we just don't need everybody having to go Google search and come across something that's maybe not right. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And read the paperwork when you buy a house, right, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> I did say that. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I know you're interested in some partnerships with um, a local governments regarding water issues. So talk you to bet. us a little about that. Well, good comments from the panel, thank you. And uh, I would say that uh, just to add on, um, I, I would love to have the Oil and Gas Commission feel they have the same great relationship with Trinidad City Council, Los Angeles County Commissioners that I feel that we have in that area. Um, probably the best example is uh, Los, the Raton Basin, coal bed methane, the nature of it, it produces extremely <clears throat> extremely good, extremely clean, fresh water as a result of the, uh, just naturally as a result of the operation. Every rancher, um, the, you know, the wildlife folks, um, every, every rancher, every person who is trying to do anything with water, conservationists that are out there in the basin, uh, the fire departments, uh, everyone wants that water. We need in this particular area to understand that produced water is a tremendous asset that we are not getting the full benefit of. I think the local community recognizes that. Well, they not only recognize it, they, they want it, they demand it. Um, they're frustrated. And I think what would be, what would be really helpful is uh, 
to use the differences in Los Animas County as an example to the broader comments that were stated here, you know, it's almost a crime not to use, you know, the produced water for virtually every beneficial use. It's fresh, it's drinkable, it's not potable, and because it has secondary characteristics, it's high in carbonates and bicarbonates. So, like a glass of Alka-Seltzer, it's good for an upset stomach. It, uh, it's very drinkable. I, I drink it every time I go out. <coughs> not glowing yet. Um, and uh, try to try to try to help people understand this is a tremendous asset that's being uh, resource that's not being properly or fully utilized and uh, could be more so and the local community gets it and so um, whether they're using their the local uh, commissioners and county are using their 1041 powers whatever I'd like my, my personal opinion is I'd like to see all the regulators working together better and giving more allowance and input and credibility to um, the local the local commissioners, the local governors, um, and the local government organizations, um, the people who live there on the ground and live and work in those communities. I, I think they are ultimately the best, best arbitrators of what is best for their area. Great. Thanks, Mark. All right, let's move on to a little bit of a sensitive topic, permitting. Quite a few permits. In, in a backlog of permits right now, not just in drilling, but also air quality, water quality. How does that impact, how do those delays in permitting impact your operations? Brian, I'm going to start with you. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll build upon the earlier comment that we want to have this timely development of our operations, which means higher activity than we can actually implement right now. So step back a little bit, COGCC, CPW, you guys do a great job. But all the observations are you're a bit overwhelmed and you can use a few more people, qualified resources to help you out. Uh, we were ecstatic, maybe as an understatement, when we heard the COGCC was picking up some additional people resources. The entire process for one of these permits, this oil and gas development plan, can be up to 18 months. It's like, how does it take 18 months? Well, there's the COGCC requirements. We've got some great partners in Weld County to work through Logla. Big thank you. But 18 months, SUAs, community engagement, regulators, and what can happen in 18 months? Well, it seems like more and more homes pop up for the DJ basin, so you have that encroachment. So we've got to go timely, things can change. So resources are a big part of that. Thank, thank you, Brian. Yeah. Kim, what do you think would be helpful in this process? What, what do you think regulators can do to speed up the, the permit process or partner with you in, in making sure those move smoothly? Yeah, yeah I, and so transparency is gonna be the most important thing. I think this kind of an open door policy where we really understand what's being asked of us because if we can provide up front exactly what's needed instead of you know, bouncing back and forth on, on getting these things done. It's a complicated process that I've you know, been introduced to. And we had a, an engagement this week with, um, with a partner and, and their point was, well, we're skeptical. Well, they're skeptical because if we need electricity to do the right things, to bring the electric fleet in of rigs, fracking, uh, electrify our facilities, well, we need to be able to give them the upfront, this is where we're going, give them the plan. So the more we can help to streamline this process, I'm not saying lax, that's not what I'm asking for, but I'm asking for that partnership as we move through. And I think there is some of that, we probably have more room to go, but having that uh, more certainty to the future allows us to be able to plan, not just with the community, but with the others that we need, and then to deliver what I would call the very modern uh, facilities that we need. So uh, up front, I think it's that transparency working together. What are the best practices? How can you tell us we could all show up in a more consistent way to deliver so it makes it easier on the people that are actually approving the permits and with the regulators? So that's my ask of what I've seen so far. I think there's partnership, but I think we have more room to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob or Mark, anything you want to add to the permitting well, process? Well, I That's just think certainty uh, and following on what Kim said. Um, when you're a small operator uh, and you, in the Peons Basin, there are three rigs operating now. One time there were 88. It takes us about a year to get the permits through. Uh, we've had uh, 
some learning curves as we go through this. We've, I think the uh, COGCC's worked well with us on uh, trying to facilitate the uh, improvement in the process and those sorts of things, but certainly in planning, particularly for a small operator, if you're drilling a well and you're spending $100,000 a day and you don't know if you're gonna get a permit or you're gonna have to lay that rig down and pay a 50,000, you know, spend 50,000 a day standby while you wait for the permit. So certainty in planning is, is really important. And I appreciate what's being done, but as Kim said, there's room for improvement on both sides. Yeah. Absolutely. Mark, anyone you want yeah, to pile on at all? About the only thing I'll add is actually I'll, uh, while at the same time I'm hugely sensitive to the concerns expressed by the panelists and I, and I agree with them, I will give a shout out to the uh, Oil and Gas Commission and the regulatory process as relates to the Raton Basin. We are, our business model is less about drilling and going in and aggressively recompleting um, thousands, of, thousands of wells that are there that are all candidates for recompletion and we have a very good relationship. Um, I'd like to find ways to improve it, but I want to say that the commission has been very good to work with in keeping the recompletions uh, ahead and giving us an inventory. Um, and it's easy to say, you know, we need to streamline the process. And by the way, we do. And, and it gets back to my comment earlier about the burdens on the regulators. How can we assist the regulators whether it's with recompletions or with drilling permits, there have, ought to be ways that a lot of the workload that is on the regulators now can be farmed out to industry because I promise you, these guys want to devote the, you know, if the Oil and Gas Commission or other groups are understaffed or feel they could use some help, these guys are more than willing to get the people involved to do exactly that. Uh, I would love to see that happen. Thank you, Mark. So we talked about challenges, we talked about ways to collaborate, but one area we haven't really talked about is risk. And we want companies to come to Colorado, but obviously with our environment right now, we want it to be as attractive as possible. Bob, tell us why investment risk is such an important factor uh, for companies in this industry. Well, there's a good news and a bad news. The good news is that we probably produce the cleanest molecule uh, in the country. The bad news is uh, we have a, a a view from Wall Street and the capital markets that this is a tough place to do business. And, uh, and it is, and that's, uh, there's some good aspects to it and some bad uh, aspects of it, but this cascade of regulations uh, continuing when we have uh, probably the best regu regulations in the country is what's creating confusion. Uh, it makes planning difficult and we need to probably just look at what we've got, administrator, administer that correctly and quit piling on these additional regulations, some of which are duplicative and unnecessary. Okay. Mark, is there <coughs> anything that we can do to make Colorado a more attractive place for investments? <laughs> well, uh, I'll first start off by echoing exactly what Bob said, my own personal experience in, in capital formation, raising money is, uh, I've gone into environments all over this country and, and around the world where people believe that Colorado is a risky place to invest. And you know, the first thing capital wants to do is, by the way, invest in the Permian. You know, they said, don't you have anything in the Permian? No. <laughs> don't you have any oil? No, no. We're 100% natural gas. Why? Because this is the clean burning fuel of the future, by the way. It is the cleanest molecules out there. And we think it is the future. Oh, why don't you have any oil? Because we don't. Well, why are you in, totally in Colorado? Because we are. Isn't that risky? Yeah. Yeah. But, okay, but we're working, you know. Well, well, well do we really want to invest capital with these in, in this area? Yes, you do, because we can work with, we can work in this environment. And yes, there is some uncertainty, but, you know, let's just be candid. Colorado is perceived as a riskier place to, to operate and to do business. One of the things, although it doesn't affect me personally on the drilling permit side, nothing would send a greater signal to the investment community than to help these guys with the issue on drilling permits. Nothing would send a greater signal to my investors and the ability to bring more capital in for me to be able to say, no, no, we have a great relationship working with the regulators. They understand the difference between the West Slope, between the DJ, between Eastern Colorado, between where we are in Southern Colorado 
in Los Animas County. Look at the things we're doing, for example. Oh, did I happen to mention produced water earlier? Because <laughs> you know, that's probably the thing that beneficial uses of produced water and showing what we're doing and how we're working with regulators and how they understand the differences, that sends a huge signal too and would assist me personally in bringing more capital in. Thank you, Mark. Kim, do you want to touch on this topic? Uh, I will leave this one alone. For All, right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to the last, and I think one of the most important questions for this panel, and, and, and it will be the wrap-up for this discussion, and then we'll open up for some questions. But all of your companies have had major successes, um, and you've adopted energy transition plans, you've achi achieved significant sustainability efforts. Um, tell us about some of those accomplishments as a company. Brian, let me start with you. Okay, so front, the energy and climate transition has already started, right? Maybe some are a little ahead of, of others, but it has started. And something really important for folks to remember, oil and gas is gonna be relevant for a very long time. And I had a reflection now, it's not on the notes here, so bear with me. 1989, imagine being a petroleum engineering student, senior year, and there was something called cold fusion. I'm like, why did I get a petroleum degree? <laughs> Later, it became cold confusion. People thought oil and gas was gonna be over, Oil and gas will stay relevant. Other energy sources will kick in, right? So they'll be additive. The population's growing, right? So thinking of the transition, so our company aligns with the EPA thing. So I think everybody's aware of EPA scope one, two, and three emissions. So with the scope one emissions, I mentioned earlier that we, I rounded it. We were 1.8 metric tons per thousand BOEs this last year. Our team's not happy with that number. We want it zero. And it's fun to hear that in the field. We're part of the community. We have people that live alongside of our operations. So we're all trying to do the right thing. Why did we get down to 1.8 metric tons per thousand BOEs? I have a slide deck of like every initiative. I can't go through them all today. Start with zero routine flaring. As an operator, Maybe it's better to make money off that molecule of gas going through a sales line than just flaring it. We've been zero routine flaring since 2013 of the DJ. Proper facilities design. We had some visitors come up from uh, uh, Texas, West Texas, the Permian, just this last week. Operations design, the way you set up those facilities makes a huge difference. Start with the right facilities design. We benefit from a 24-7 a integrated operations center. We can monitor, we can catch problems, fix it, we can shut in, we can start things back up. We don't want any problems, but there's still room to improve. I'm confident our team will continue to improve our scope one emissions. Scope two emissions, that's going back to power, whether an operator develop, uh, generates it or maybe a utility company that maybe has a coal-fired power plant in the background. How do we address scope two emissions, so that electricity you needed to run a field, and that includes electrifying a rig, right? We piloted it, it works great. Yep. So a really neat one for Colorado that we're, we're really proud of, so we have a geothermal pilot lined up for the DJ. Most everybody in here has probably been to the hot, uh, hot springs somewhere in Colorado at some point. We have, quote, unquote, quote, in quotes, with the governor, heat beneath our feet. So it's a great opportunity. Late 2024, we'll be drilling uh, a well. We've got Texas A&M, School of Mines, Sorry. LSU. We've got some academias, folks involved. 20,000 feet, 575 degrees Fahrenheit. It will use a thermo siphon, two wells come, coming together. So we're gonna set the stage for some mission-free power. It's 24-7. And I got to do a shout out, right? It's like, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know about the state how pro oil and gas they are, but Governor Polis is supportive of us about this on, on this endeavor. The uh, DOE gave us a grant of $9 million uh, that was awarded. And then we'll go to the EPA scope three. Now this is the tough one, right? This is a really tough one. That molecule of hydrocarbon eventually is gonna get consumed in a mobile source, maybe the vehicle you drove in on the way here today, maybe a train, maybe a plane, tankers, whatever it is, or 
stationary sources like a power plant. How do we address that? Well, Oxy has a plan for this and others do too. So what things are we gonna do? Well, we have a, an approved budgeted pilot for injecting gas in the DJ. It's a precursor to be able to capture CO2 and inject it into either saline aquifer or an oil reservoir, but we're pilot is for an oil reservoir. The only thing we've got to work through is the permitting. Yeah, we could probably add that to the list of some help. Uh, the next thing is we're going to think CO2 molecules, they don't really stay, they don't know about geographical boundaries like a state line or a county line. So we've also got a pilot envisioned for the Powder River Basin. We've done a handful of pilots uh, that have been very encouraging in the Permian Basin. Uh, maybe take a lesson from the state of Wyoming. They have class six primacy, right? That would be a good thing for Colorado to do. We believe between oil reservoirs, sequest putting uh, CO2 in the, into that oil reservoir to get more oil out, and also sequestering CO2. Oxy's the biggest CO2 flutter in the world. Uh, Chevron does that rangely, but think two and a half BCF a day of injection. Huge. Uh, DAX, direct air capture. So it's one thing to capture it off a power plant, but think of all these sources. CO2 concentrations across the globe have gone up from like 280 parts per million to 420 parts per million. That's 50% since the Industrial Revolution started. <laughs> Way before I'm a petroleum engineer, an oil and gas guy, I'm an environmentalist. I recognize that global climate change has been occurring. We're going to do something about it. These mobile sources, direct air capture, Oxy will have the largest in the world operational in 2025. We we're hoping into 2024, but supply chain is just not what it used to be. Drive by a car lot recently in the last two years. It'll be a half million metric tons a year. So that's our first of bigger ones to come. That's nearly 500 fold bigger, or, or uh, the, the biggest one, the biggest one in the world right now is 4,000 uh, tons. So 500,000, 120 fold. The one that I just saw in the news recently for Denver, it's one. So this is huge. So the first one of those to get started up in Oxy in the Permian, expect more of those bigger. We've got the King Ranch, for example, which are also environmentalists to go with a, one of our sequestration hubs. So capturing those CO2 molecules. And then we've got to think a little bit ahead of how things are going to evolve. So a really clever technology for a next generation power plant is called net power. So what the air we breathe is like 79% nitrogen, right? We've got to take oxygen, pure oxygen, burn it with hydrocarbon gas, and you just get two byproducts, CO2 and water. That CO2 can go get sequestered. It can go to an oil reservoir, but it's pressured up, and there's actually power left over to maybe run. You can run the DAC and maybe some power for the community. So we think that's huge for us. Oxy's got three firm commitments. If anybody's met our CEO, these deadlines will be will, will, will be way before these. She's she's not overly patient, right? In a good way. We're gonna get net zero, address scope one, two, and three emissions across the board. Zero routine flaring by 2030, and you go, well, oil company, well, we did it since 2013 in DJ. Domestic onshore achieved it last year. So it's really just our international assets. So I think we can beat it before 2030. The scope one and two emissions completely addressing those by 2040. So we've got a plan for that, we touched on that but net zero for the ultimate use of our products. That takes a little further out, but the before 2050. And that's it, okay. thank you. A short list, right? <laughs> <laughs> short list. <laughs> Actually, not doing anything, are they? <laughs> this is probably the thing that people are most passionate about in our office, and people literally sign up to say, how can I help? How Love do I contribute? It. Love yeah. it, thank you, thank you. Bob, talk about Laramie, who's well, the plan? I, I think it's a mindset, and one of the things we try to do in our company is our incentive plans uh, have an element, a component of it uh, that relates to uh, achieving certain targets, environmental targets. And those are targets, our targets are much better than the targets that the state has. And that, so it's a mindset in our people as we work that they understand that this is an important part of what they do. 
Uh, we do, you know, with uh, flareless completions, we do LDAR to check methane, we do uh, electrical uh, uh, pneumatic valves, all those sorts of things that we can control, we do to make our footprint less and less on the environment. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's fabulous what Oxy does and Chevron, these leaders, in terms of sustainability, the geothermal, um, the solar, and the different things they're doing, the carbon capture, uh, those are fantastic technologies. I wrote my master's thesis in 1973 on alternative uh, uh, energy technologies with respect to uh, a national energy policy. And those alternatives haven't really changed, but now they're starting to be implemented. So my hat's off to you guys, and uh, we're doing the best we can in Colorado. And I, I think the innovation we have in our, in our industry and in, uh, in our companies are, uh, demonstrate that. And you can see that in the record of what we've done in reducing emissions and, and how we've improved uh, uh, actually reduced emissions while we've uh, increased 90, uh, gas production significantly. So um, I think we're all on the same page. Thanks, Mark, and then we'll let Kim close out. Talk about your geothermal plan. Well, uh, you know, a couple things. Uh, just uh, we're talking about transition and envision a better future. Uh, one of the things that we have documented and are attempting to continue to document is as a result of coal bed methane extraction in the Raton Basin, there is a, over the last 20 years, based on the COGCC's own data uh, collected, and we're encouraging uh, additional, additional work in this area. Uh, there is a 97% reduction in fugitive methane emissions from the Los Animas County Raton Basin as a result of coal bed methane extraction. And why is that? Because uh, a lot of our wells were drilled around abandoned mines. There are not just dozens, there are over a hundred abandoned coal mines and there are outcrops of coals and it's pretty well documented now that as a result of degassing the basin that there's been this huge beneficial impact if you were to stop producing coal bed methane out of the Raton Basin, you would get more fugitive emissions. Um, but the real opportunity is <coughs> The future I, I envision for this area and a transition that affects this, <clears throat> Brian mentioned a power plant. I would love to see a, a co-generated clean power plant right in the middle of what we're doing and we have not given up on that dream and goal. Uh, have some ideas how to make it happen using wind, solar, geothermal to co-generate power as well as the gas there. Uh, the Raton Basin has the highest geothermal gradient of any of the basins in Colorado. So that gives us the great, a great geothermal opportunity. And we have a couple thousand well bores that are all candidates for this. Um, and so the governor's heat beneath our feet initiative, we're already talking to the local school, uh, Primero uh, High School already uses geothermal for heating. We're looking at ways to help them with that, supplement it and understand the applications for, uh, for geothermal in the area. Uh, and I envision a transition ultimately for that basin into uh, a wonderful co-generated combination, gas production, geothermal, solar uh, assisted. Uh, there are places where it makes sense to put, you know, solar powered pumps on, on remote wells. So these, these things can all work together. And as we heard in the presentation at lunch yesterday, uh, you know, we need everything, you know, so it sounds, may sound funny to people that an oil or gas producer would say, no, we need wind, solar, geothermal. No, we do, we, we need everything. But, you know, it's oil and, it's oil and gas that are going to, that are the base load, that are going to carry us into the future. So how do we do it with a cleaner future, with a better vision? And I'm delighted by what I'm hearing. Thank you, Mark. Great point. All right, Kim. Tell us about, brag about Chevron's plan. Mm -hmm. and close I will, it out. and I'll keep it short so we can get to the questions. Um, look, I want to start. I'm going to go back to affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy. We believe in that. And Chevron is committed $10 billion over the time period from 21 to 28 to invest in lower carbon technology. Two billion of that is to reduce the emissions of our own operations. So I think that's really important. And, and what's the benefit of a Chevron? Well, the benefit is we have operations all over the world, all over the United States. So we are able to trial and pilot things in all these various areas to make an impact on our other operations. And I just want to say, in front of this group, Noble was doing some fantastic things. 
we want to continue doing those fantastic things and up it, right? And so when I go and look at what we're doing today, and I mentioned some of that technology, but even just recycling water. We are recycling produced water. I never thought in my career we would sit around and go, and, darn it, wish we made a little more water, because we could use more of the recycled, right? But I just think it's really important that as we're working through this, and that, you know, I'm gonna go back to that help piece, because as we do these comprehensive development plans, technology is going to continue to grow. And I think some flexibility as we are trying to lower those, those emissions, cleaner energy, we're gonna need a bit of flexibility because a plan that was put in place could actually be outdated by the time we get to execute. And I think we have to, to consider that. But I, I will tell you, Chevron is committed to that. We have a Chevron New Energies, which is a whole company within Chevron that is out there with startups and investing in these technologies, technologies we don't even know we need yet. And I think that's really important that we're investing. And one last thing is we actually restructured the company. And if you think about, we used to be, many of you have like upstream, midstream, downstream, these were separate silos operating. We actually restructured to be OPG, which is oil production uh, and gas. And so what that does is it's the entire value chain. So now we are making decisions impacting all of it instead of siloed. So it allows us to look at the entire emissions of a value chain and change things to improve. So a lot of technology being developed, but I think that was an important step to what we can do now to change things. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you all. This is great. So let's open it up for some questions. I think we have about five, a little bit over five minutes. Do we have someone with a, a mic running around? Oh, we got a couple hands over here. Gentleman in the um, red, maroon. <laughs> maroon, we like that. No, there we go. <laughs> Hello, how's it going? Uh, my name is Ethan Ward from Colorado Mason University. Um, I just had a question for the entire panel. Um, I'm just wondering, in your opinion, what is the, uh, the most time-consuming step in the permitting process hmm. and uh, what you can do to change that? Is there one person that wants to tackle that one just based on our time right now? Bob? Uh, you know, I think the initial preparation work uh, is the, to make certain that we've got checked all the boxes. And if you, we have a, Katie uh, Middleton with us, he's back here, has prepared a whole chart that covers part of a wall on the different elements that we, uh, different things we have to comply with, reports and things. So I think getting it right on the first time and then it, sending it in, uh, it, they can send back with questions and those sorts of things. But the, the COGCC is now considering a kind of a preemptive first step where you put the, uh, uh, all the, what we think is the required information together. They'll look at it very quickly, review it, and get us back, back to us quickly. So that's one of the things that's uh, being considered. But it's that initial preparation given all the number of different elements that we have to comply with. Thanks for the question. I think there's a gentleman yeah. right next to it. Same well, table. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Will Fleckenstein from the Colorado School of Mines. And first, if anybody has some thoughts about geothermal, love to talk to you about it. The second is, I want to give a shout out to Julie Murphy and the COGCC uh, for a recent grant they gave to us to study uh, flow lines and to come up with a more predictive type of a, uh, of a model uh, to predict uh, flow lines to try and prevent the tragedy similar to uh, what had happened to the Martinez family at uh, Firestone. Uh, but getting into that, I just was curious. I, I've got an article in front of me from the Denver Post, and it said that uh, after 1,300 pipelines, damages to pipelines in 2013, there were no civil penalties or sanctions that had been issued because it's up to the pipe owners uh, to you know, have civil lawsuits. So I was wondering, how protected are your flow lines uh, you know, from third party uh, types of, uh, of damages, especially as you're getting uh, you know, building that's right in the middle of facilities uh, that you have. I, I'm just curious, has this changed or is, is there neither regulation needs to be put in place to kind of help protect some of your facilities and pipelines? Thanks for the question. Probably Who more, would like you're to more urban, so probably from <laughs> the more urban well, perspective. Thank you so much for the question. So following the tragedy, there was a big effort to go identify all the flow lines. That was step one. A big decommissioning effort was the next part of that. And now we're, what we have with all of our current facilities, things are known. I don't really see that as a big concern as of right now. So if you want to talk about that some more, we can. Uh, Thank you, Brian. Yeah, one more question here. Uh, Steve Swartjack, Colorado Mesa University. I think you all ought to be commended for producing a valuable resource in this country today. 
People don't understand how difficult it is, especially in the field, to harness natural gas, high pressure. You talked about blowouts. I've been on five blowouts during my career. Yeah. And you need to educate people more on how hard it is to produce energy and how to make it affordable and reliable. I think, again, all the producers in this room need to be commended for what they do each day to bring cheap, or I should say affordable, reliable, and going back to what Chris Wright says in his ESG report, you guys are bettering humanity. Thank you. If I could, because I'd love that, thank you, because I'm a second generation driller. My dad was in the industry. He retired, he went into cattle ranching. So we kind of have both extremes now. He wants us to catch the methane off his cows, but that's not gonna work. <laughs> but, but I am proud of what I do. I believe in this industry. I believe we do make lives better where we operate. And if you look at lifespan, medical care, all of these things, whether we're going into new countries or we're just operating here, right here in Colorado. And our story needs to be, I think Scott did a great job yesterday. We owe it to get our story out there and the good things, everyone up here is reducing emissions. But you probably out in the community, they don't know that. So doing those right things and making that happen. I have two daughters who are gonna come into the industry and I want that. I want these generations to continue. So thank you for that and thank you to all of you because you continue to support what I believe is, and to your point, is the base of all of this. It's not one or the other, it's an expansion of energy and that's what we need to keep in mind. So thank you, thank you so much. Can I add one thing quickly to that? Ahead, that and that is, uh, I'm not second generation. I, wandered into the industry because I wanted to climb mountains, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and I thought after I got in it, oh great, I'll find out what, you know, what these guys are really up to, and I went on from the inside, and what I found is a huge amount of environmental awareness, people who grew up in our generation grew up with that enhanced environmental sensitivity, everybody wants clean water, everybody wants clean air, everybody loves the Colorado lifestyle, and I found that whether you come in through second generation driller or you wander in off the mountain like I did, um, you know, everybody has, has tremendous environmental values and want to do the right thing. And so this industry needs, need, doesn't somehow get that message out, but the people in the key decision making places are doing it with enhanced biological, environmental uh, sensitivity and awareness. And, you know, shout out to the industry for the people who are making the decisions and who genuinely care about making the world a better place. Great point to end on. We're glad you came off that mountain, Mark. So thank you. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause for this panel.